Hallo Eier. Weiter geht's jetzt hier im Programm beim zweiten Tag der Republika 2013. Ich habe mich gerade mal versucht, so ein bisschen zurückzuerinnern. Vor 20 Jahren habe ich in so einer kleinen Band gespielt und äh, mein Bassist war der erste Mensch, den ich kannte, der so ein mobiles äh, Telefon hatte. Ein furchtbar hässliches, braunes mit orangenen Tasten. Und wenn man sich das mal anguckt, das war vor 20 Jahren, kann man sich ja ungefähr vorstellen, wohin die Entwicklung technologiemäßig noch geht in den nächsten 20 Jahren. Also man kann es sich ja eigentlich nicht vorstellen. Ähm, und was bedeutet das? Auf der einen Seite kann man natürlich verstehen und es ganz, ganz furchtbar finden, wenn die Regierungen und Organisationen dieser Welt diese Daten äh, von uns so gerne haben wollen. Auf der anderen Seite wollen wir aber auch wissen, was die Regierung und Organisationen mit den Daten machen und vor allen Dingen, was für Daten sie selber generieren. Und ganz genau darum wird es jetzt gehen. Und zwar ein Mann aus New York City wird ganz genau darüber reden, 60 Minuten lang. Sein Name Andrew Roger. Bitte schön. Guten Tag. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be in Berlin. It's the first time I've ever been here. What a fantastic, beautiful city. I'm very, very impressed. Um, and because I'm in Germany, I want to tell one of my favorite stories about one of the most famous Germans uh, in the world. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard this story, but when Albert Einstein was first sharing his theory of relativity, uh, he was going from university to university, traveling, Uh, from place to place, sometimes making three or four speeches a day. And when he uh, was doing this for about three months, he was getting really, really tired. And he fell back in the seat of his, uh, of his limousine and complained to the driver that he was so tired he just didn't really want to make the same speech over and over again. And the limousine driver said, uh, uh, Herr Einstein, I've heard your speech so many times, I can give this speech myself. Why don't we change places at the next university? So, of course, that's what they did. They, they changed places. Einstein put on the chauffeur's hat, sat in the back of the room, and the chauffeur got on stage, and since no one had ever seen Einstein before, they didn't have the internet then, no one could do a search to, look, to know what he looked like, they thought they were listening to Einstein, and the chauffeur delivered the speech exactly the same way as Einstein would at any of the previous speeches. And when it, the speech was over, a professor in the audience raises his hand and asks an incredibly complicated question. And without missing a second or a beat, the chauffeur says, you know, that question is so simple, I'm going to let my chauffeur answer it. <laughs> so um, the other thing I wanted to do, since, you know, in the United States, we only sp when we do uh, talks like this, we talk for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes. TED Talks, are, I think, are 18 minutes. So. Um, Trying to speak for uh, the hour they gave is way more than I'm used to and more than I have in my brain. So I'm going to try to speak for about 30 minutes and then, um, and then we'll do questions and answers. But before, just to put me in the best mood possible, I want you to know that today is my birthday. So if you don't mind, could you all sing happy birthday to me? Thank you very much. Okay, let's begin. So, in Egypt, during the protests, many Egyptians were following the, the Tahrir Square uh, uh, demonstrations and other events in Egypt by sitting at home, paying attention to the internet. And at some point, at the height of the protests, and many of you know this story, Mubarak ordered Vodafone to shut the internet off. And the people who were at home, who were watching and, and paying attention, did what we would do if, for example, the internet was shut off in Berlin, or if the electricity was shut off in our apartments. We would go out into the street to find out what was going on. And 
when Mubarak shut off the internet in Egypt, that's exactly what happened, and this, the protest actually swelled, putting more people on the street, and making it seem as if the protests were getting larger. And a young University of Texas professor by the name of Dave Parry wrote a blog post where he said the following, you can shut off the public internet, but you can't shut off the internet public. And for many of us who have been working in the arena of technology and politics and civil society, it seemed that that's, that sentence galvanized in our minds something that we had been watching happening over the last 10 or 15 years as more and more people use the internet for social good, for political action, for, free, for making their voices heard, for organizing. Now, a member of the internet public is not a digital native. And it's not a millennial, as some anthropologists or sociologists might describe. A member of the internet public is some, someone for whom the internet is central to their lives, either economically, socially, culturally, in this case politically, emotionally, or even spiritually. It is a different kind of human being. And yes, it skews younger, but it doesn't have a specific prejudice towards one generation more than the other. If you want to be a member of the internet public, you can be, regardless of your age. Now, if you want to get a sense of how fast this internet public is growing, this is a picture of the Vatican in 2005. And you can see on the right side, right where the arrow is uh, pointing, to, on the left side of the arrow, you can see one person with a mobile phone. This was at the moment when Pope Benedict was chosen in the Vatican in 2005. If you'd like to see what it looks like today, this is the internet public, or I should say, this is the internet public. In about 10 years, there are going to be six billion devices in our hands that will remind us of our smartphones. But they're going to be so advanced that our smartphones that we are carrying today will feel like this looks like us, to us today, a, motor, a briefcase phone from 15 years ago. In fact, we probably will be looking at movies 10 years from now where people will be looking at their Blackberries and their iPhones and we'll be laughing that, and saying to ourselves, people did that? Really? Maybe, you know, we were thinking we'll be wearing glasses or maybe they'll be embedding chips. But the technology continues to move faster and faster, and we should be careful not to assume that what we have today is going to stay the same. Now, back to the Internet public. You can, you can sense the DNA or s see strands of the Internet public in the behavior of people all around the world in protests. So, for example, this is the SOPA protest in New York, which was organized by the New York Tech Meetup put 2,500 people on the street on the day that the internet went dark. And of course, the ACTA protests in Europe, which were extensive. And you could see it in the way the Coney 2012 video took off around the world, built up on massive social networks and organizing by, by uh, people for many, many months, in fact, years before this video took off. Yesterday, you heard Diana Zan speak about the battle between Planned Parenthood and Susan G. Komen. Again, another example of the internet public making its voice heard. And you can see strands of this DNA in the student protests in Tel Aviv, in the internet protests in Turkey, in the student protests in Chile, in the million voices against FARC, not just in Colombia, but throughout South America and other parts of the world. You even see it in places where you would think the internet is much harder to use for free speech, in places like Russia, or even in China, where it might be impossible to actually write on a blog what you really think of the government 
But even in this case with Chen Guangchen, when he was fighting for the right to travel to the United States, millions of Chinese posted pictures of themselves wearing dark glasses as their profile po photos in solidarity, letting themselves and letting people in the world know they were members of the internet public. And you can even see the internet public in Gangnam Style. I mean, think about it. A video that receives over a billion views in four months across the planet. This was not possible 10 years ago. And it may be more possible, and we'll, see, and we'll, be, we'll be reminiscing about Gangnam Style because our cultural, and connect, uh, our cultural norms of what's acceptable is being transformed because of this same DNA. But you know, all of the examples I gave, except for Gangnam Style, for the most part, were protest movements. And many people say that the internet so far has only done a good job in organizing us to say no. But I can show you a couple examples where organizing is actually saying yes, actually building something. So Eric Hertzman was here yesterday from Yushahidi, but Yushahidi mapping wasn't just used initially to, to, to make it known to the world about the elections in Africa, in Kenya, but is now being used as the default crisis mapping tool for earthquakes, for flooding, for forest fires, even for parking spaces in New York City, Boston, and, and uh, Washington, D.C. In many parts of the world, there are projects like Fix My Street, where people can take pictures of potholes and post them online and crowdsource their infrastructure of their city. And more and more cities are now listening and paying attention and responding to these requests. Kickstarter, a project started in, a, in Brooklyn, New York. So I put these, this slide up because the National Endowment, which is the, national, the US National Program for the Arts, had a budget last year of $146 million. And Kickstarter, a startup that only did, that didn't exist three years ago, last year raised $320 million for arts projects without the help of the government, just through the internet public. In 2008, uh, a, a group of technologists got together and started thinking whether Twitter could be used for monitoring elections and produced a project called the Twitter Vote Report, where over 50,000 Americans going to their polling places posted images, tweets about long lines, broken voting machines, in effect, a Jimmy Carter election monitoring program on steroids, which is now used in many other places in the world to monitor elections. Challenge.gov, which is a platform that allows the government to put problems online and allow citizens, coders, entrepreneurs to solve those problems on a massive scale. And this is one of my favorite examples of the internet public. This is a project called Project Masuleke. And it was started about six years ago in South Africa, where a young woman who was HIV positive, who was running a hospice in South Africa, came to a conference in, in, in Maine, the United States, called PopTech, and told the story of the fact that her, her, in her hospice, 40% of her nurses were HIV positive that 40% of her country was HIV positive, but that her country was in denial, that there was no political will to inform the public how to protect themselves, how to uh, uh, be tested, to wear condoms. The government was in denial. There was no public awareness campaign. And she was begging for a solution to try to get the word out. Now, normally, foundations would come together, Governments would come together, people would raise money, and they would start buying television ads or radio ads or billboards along highways, informing people that they should wear condoms or that they should be tested. But they didn't have this kind of money, and the AIDS epidemic was raging in other parts of the world as well. So a group of technologists got together and started looking at the problem and realized that there were 35 million text messages sent in South Africa every single day, of which 7 million were just three letters, PCM, which stands for please call me. 
And the reason why those 7 million messages were sent that way was because many people in South Africa didn't have minutes on their phone. They couldn't afford it. So they would text PCM to a friend who might have minutes on their phone, and that friend would call them so they could actually speak. But whenever they did this, it would leave 157 characters of white space in the text message unused. So these technologists working with Zinni went to the telco companies in South Africa and asked them whether they would allow a public service message to be embedded into that text message. And so they agreed for 5% of the, of the uh, text messages that were sent that there would be a message that would say, do you have a fever? If you have a fever, maybe you should go and be tested for HIV. If you're going out, are you bringing condoms? If you're having unprotected sex, your chances of contracting AIDS are much higher. And these messages started going out, and the AIDS hotline in South Africa saw a 500% increase in traffic. And I don't have the exact figure, but uh, somewhere in the area of 500,000 people have now been tested for HIV because of this service. And the service is now expanding to warn people about other diseases in South Africa, in, in not just South Africa, throughout Africa, around malaria and tuberculosis, using white space in text messages as public service announcements. But let's stop for a second. Because I think we're all excited about the internet and we all love it. It means a great deal to us. We're spending time here, meeting each other, listening to crazy people from the United States speak on stage. But we have a problem. I'm going to ask the audience, I can't see every, very well, but how many people here have read a terms of service all the way through before you said, Yes, I agree. Three hands. Four hands. This is the Facebook terms of service. It's endless. It continues on forever, and we have no idea what it says. What the fuck are we doing? Are we relying on the government to protect us? Are we relying on companies to protect us? We are so enamored by these technologies, so seduced by them, by the desire for information, by the desire to be connected, that we are just saying, I agree. This is what privacy is in today's world. Seriously. Look at that image. Someone actually built that, <laughs> maybe for this photograph to be taken. This is the image of four squares traffic throughout the world. And this is Facebook's. And this is Twitter's. And this is the flow of data. And as you can see, it all goes through the United States. And this is the way the National Security Agency monitors traffic in the United States. Another question. Of all the companies I showed you, Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare, that you use, is anyone here absolutely sure that your personal data was never shared with the government or some other inappropriate source without your knowledge? Is there someone here who's absolutely sure that that data was protected? Is there anyone here willing to raise their hand to say that? What are we doing? Seriously. We're not asking questions. The internet was shut off in Egypt because Vodafone was ordered to by Mubarak? Vodafone, a European company? Maybe there's some shareholders in the room? Maybe you should be asking what they were doing listening to Mubarak? In the United States, during the Sandy Hurricane, 
our cell phones stopped working. Power was off. The diesel generators for the cell, phone cell towers only lasted for eight hours. No one's asking, is this the way it should be? In Boston, after the bombing, cell phones stopped working. I hope because of the fact that they weren't shut off, but because so many people were using them. But we're not asking ourselves the question, what is the proper infrastructure for our internet public in an era where fear is a commodity being sold and traded by our politicians? I'll show you the real picture. The ring of steel. We have so many of these cameras. It's estimated that in London and in New York, people are photographed thousands of times during the course of the day. And it's been studied that these cameras are actually not reducing crime, and that the cost of them could put hundreds and thousands of more police officers on the street than watch having them watch us in this way. And they're watching us. Notice that it's all men, by the way. I'd like to see women not only brought into higher roles of public service, because I believe that if women were given an opportunity to have share equally with men politically, there'd be far less death and destruction in the world. And it was mentioned yesterday that if your tech conference is 90% rubbish, I'm sorry, 90% men, I'm sorry, it's rubbish. Well, you know what? I'm not, I'm, I'm challenging the men in this city who are t here today at a tech conference to ask the next time you're going to the tech conference, write to them and ask them what the ratio of men to women are. If we want to change the world, we have to do it. It's not the tech, tech, the tech conference organizer. It's certainly not the men sitting at these terminals. It's us. And the technology is so great. Face recognition software. It's coming, it's here. Think about the ring of steel matched with this technology. And ask yourself again, are you sure that those companies that you're signing up to have not shared any of their data inappropriately? Now, we watched the protests of SOPA in the US, and we were envious, actually, of the way in which Europe organized against ACTA and actually really pissed off at ourselves that nobody in the United States even knew that the United States was signing on to ACTA. I always say, I can't believe I still say this, politicians don't know the difference between a server and a waiter. But even worse, technologists do not know the difference between a bill and a check. The disconnect between the world of technology and the world of politics is so far apart. The, the battle over SOPA is not going to happen in the United States again. It happened because the technology industry or the internet public was not part of the political process. And as markets, market, incumbent market players like the record industry, like the movie industry, like the American Chamber of Commerce, started to see their markets erode further because they failed to innovate, because they wanted to continue to monopolize copyright and other rights that they had built up using money in politics for decades. They went to Congress and they overreached. And finally, in overreaching, they woke up a sleeping giant called the internet public. And we showed up just in time to get Congress to turn those bills away. 
But Congress isn't going to be fooled a second time because, frankly, Congress got punched in the stomach by the SOPA protests. And you know what it's like when you're punched in the stomach when you know it's coming and when you don't know it's coming? Well, Congress got punched in the stomach by SOPA when it didn't know it's coming, but now they're watching. And so incumbents, whether it be the copyright industry, or whether it be the hotel industry, or whether it be the car industry, or whether it be the oil industry, or whether it be the healthcare industry, or whether it be the religious industry, they are going to continue to use their influence through the old political system to try and keep the internet from being open. For them, the internet is a foreign object. It is not something that they want. It's not something they need. It's not something they like. We are fooling ourselves if we're thinking that we are going to declare a declaration of internet freedom. We do not have an open democracy. In the United States, our elected leaders choose us. We don't choose them. They turn their districts into snakes so they can make sure that only people who like them vote for them. We vote only on Tuesdays, which was market day in 1785, when farmers, no men, were coming to vote. I'm saying only men coming to vote. We have closed primaries, and we have far too much money in politics. And we have something silly called the Electoral College, where you can get more votes from all the Americans, all American citizens, on election day, but still lose the election because we count electoral votes based on states, and so now our presidents are chosen based on six or seven states that are in the balance. So if we want an open internet, are we really going to get it by demanding free speech on the internet? The way we have the cart before the horse, the way it should work is we should be fighting everywhere for open democracy so that the open internet is a byproduct of an open democracy. It's not the other way around. We're fooling ourselves if we think it is. CISPA. The internet public on, got together for SOPA. I bet you 95% of the people who showed up at the protests in New York or anywhere else didn't even read the entire law. They showed up because their friends told them it was cool. Great. We managed to stop it. But now those incumbents are not going to attack the internet directly. They're going to use little razor blades and start cutting little cuts here and there. Because they're going to assume that we're not going to read the bill. Because we're not. We're not reading the terms of service. Why would we read a piece of legislation? what law enforcement needs to spy on you. This is a United States law, but this can be applied across other democracies as well. Currently, you need a warrant, a subpoena, or a national security letter, but if CISPA, CISPA passes, all they can do is just search. I can't see if I can get this down here, but basically, right now, the only people who can search without a warrant is the NSA. If CISPA passes, the IRS, Interpol, the U.S. Army, Veteran Affairs, Amtrak, the train, Federal train comp uh, Public Train Company, Homeland Security, U.S. Postal Service, and of course, immigration. We can't allow the internet to die by a thousand little cuts. We are because we're pressing agree all the time. I don't know, I kind of feel like this now has been replaced by this. There was so much hope that Obama was going to be the president that was going to change the system. There was even more hope after he won a second term that he would, that he had to basically play hardball the first term and that he would blow the system up in the second term. This administration is more clandestine, more secretive, 
more vindictive against whistleblowers than the Bush administration. They're talking about, just as an example, they're talking about removing people in prison in Guantanamo and moving them to a national security facility in the United States they're on a, because they're on a hunger strike. They're not protesting because of their location. So when you see this, maybe we should be thinking about this. They have one of those. They do. We should have the right to decide when that switch goes on or off. In fact, maybe we should decide that it's hardwired only on. I really don't mind if the government watches me, as long as I can watch the government back. Another question, when was the last time one of you wrote a letter asking the government, I want to watch back? A FOIL request. No one. Not a single person here has ever filed a Freedom of Information Act request. One person. Two people, okay, this five or six, okay, thank you. So here's a, here's a piece of legislation that I would suggest that you all write to your legislators about. It's called the Public Online Information Act. It was proposed in Congress, it got two sen a senator and a congressman to support it. No other member of Congress supported this bill. And what this piece of legislation said was that anywhere in existing law, or an existing regulation where a piece of information or a document is required to be public, it can no longer be considered public unless it's machine readable and searchable online. It doesn't change freedom of information law requests because you can request a piece of information from the government that isn't necessarily required to be public. And if you receive it, you don't necessarily have to make it public. You could be a journalist researching a story. You're allowed to ask the government for your documents in the countries where they have freedom of information laws. I realize that not everywhere has them. But imagine if the internet public was to demand that we redefine the term public as machine readable and searchable online. There was a gentleman who was supposed to speak here. He didn't, he didn't show, unfortunately, um, Evgeny, Mor Evgeny Morosov, who wrote a recent book that advocates that federal election reports, financing reports, who is giving money to whom, should be read only and not digitized. That's crazy talk. And no one is complaining. In fact, if Jenny has a column in the New York Times, because the mainstream media, by the way, also doesn't like the internet very much. It's a foreign object. So I just want to play a little piece of this video for you because this, is, oh, this reminds me of the idea that we can watch the government back if we choose. This is a video taken by a drone flying over the act of protest in Warsaw. So while it's playing, let me ask you, do you think that our governments are going to allow us to do this in 10 years when drones are everywhere? They're not. This is a metaphor for our political system. We should be able to fly internet drones over the internet to protect it, to protect ourselves. But it won't happen if we press agree without reading what we're agreeing to. The open internet depends on you. Don't wait for the government. Don't wait for those companies. 
Do it today. How wonderful it would be that when someone looks at Wikipedia 10 years from now, that someone can say that because of Republica, the internet is now open. Thank you very much. So. Jetzt geht's an die Fragen. Wir haben einmal hier, ich bin hier vorne unterwegs, gehst du nach hinten mit dem Mikrofon, dass es ausgeglichen ist. Uh, Andrew, thanks for the numerous call to actions. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, one or two questions. Uh, can you make a prediction by when the true digital global democracy will have its breakthrough and who will be in charge? Okay, so uh, I'm not quite sure we're, we're going to have a breakthrough anytime soon. In Congress, for example, in the United, right now there's about six members of Congress who know how the internet actually works. We're not electing ourselves, we're not electing people into government that understand this. And, you know, uh, each political system is different. We should have not just one pirate party trying to change political uh, will in countries. We should have dozens of them. And there's not enough. So I'm not optimistic, actually. I used to be very optimistic that there would be more change sooner, that this technology would create more opportunities for political change. But it may take another 10 or 15 years. There's a great book, if you haven't read it, by Stephen Johnson called Future Perfect, where he tries to make a case that all of this connectivity, the DNA of the internet public, is actually a, a political movement. It's not a party. It's an ideology, a political ideology. Some of it is associated with what's known as the peer economy or the sharing economy. There is really two, they're really sometimes very different things. There are companies that are using this connectivity to create businesses like Airbnb and uh, various car sharing apps that are out there. Um, and those are, in some cases, very remarkable services. But there are other people who believe that we should use these technologies to create an entirely different fabric of society where people are sharing with each other, bartering with each other, uh, and not looking at the GDP of a given country to determine whether the country is doing well. It's a completely different perspective. That idea, that political idea, is just a little, tiny little light on the horizon right now. It won't change until our generation of technologically active and politically active uh, citizens start running for office and actually changing the law and, for example, passing a law like the Public Online Information Act. Another question, please. Hello. Um, when I first saw the topic of your talk, I thought it would be a little bit more optimistic when it comes to how open internet can bring open democracy, but maybe I was wrong, I guess. And I was wondering, um, do you see any hope? And um, why don't we have more decent politicians? What can you do to change that? So I, okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm actually a little shocked at myself that I'm, I'm coming across as being so pejorative, but I am worried. Uh, and I wasn't so worried when I first got into this industry. So, um, you know, uh, let, let me describe it to you this way. E-government is government agencies delivering the services that we expect them to deliver using the tools that we use every day. So we can pay our parking tickets online, we can pay our taxes, uh, maybe apply for, or make sure our students go to public school, get our social security benefits. And more and more governments are doing this. But with all those phones that everyone has and all the devices, people are starting to collect data themselves, sometimes on purpose, like taking pictures of potholes, obviously, but sometimes just in the background where they take pictures of where uh, traffic patterns and other things are exposed. And governments are starting to let more and more data out because there are some innovators in government that believe that government data is in be in better in the hands of the public than in the hands 
of commissioners or, or secretaries in government offices. And so what's happening is, is that instead of some of these technologies, the, the data from the government and the data that's being collected by citizens are coming together and creating not e-government, but what I call we government. Where citizens and sometimes companies are building platforms and tools and services that are useful for people in their daily lives and they're doing it faster and better than government can. So I had an argument with a friend of mine in, uh, in, in, in New York uh, recently who said, well, you know, with this we government idea you have, uh, you know, people are still going to need driver's licenses in 30 years. So you'll still need the government. And I was like, really? If there are autonomous cars, are we really going to need driver's licenses? Are we really going to uh, stand in line at a government office 30 years from now and apply for one? Maybe there'll be a commons that will be ru ru ruling. Or maybe we won't actually, we'll have social norms where we won't actually own cars ourselves. We'll share cars because we know it's better for the planet. You know, it took the British Navy 150 years before it, it put lime juice in, on ships after it was discovered that lime juice prevents scurvy. It's going to take maybe another 20 or 30 years. Frankly, this is an anthropological problem, not a technological problem. Another question, please. Yes, sir. I'll get to you in a second. Hi, Andrew. Um, thank you for uh, asking a very critical question on our over-reliance on technology. But it seems that um, one of the problems that we press agree is because um, we expect the text to be machine-readable, but we don't think about human-readable text. Surely we should be demanding that these terms of agreement um, should be more human friendly um, and, and actually have agencies to uh, interpret them for us, maybe. So an, an idea that would be great if someone in this room wants to make is there should be a website called BeforeYouAgree.com where we take the terms of service of major companies like Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare and Microsoft and Google and we post it on a site where we allow citizens to translate the terms of service into plain language that everyone can understand and then rate it so we can know that others think that this is a safe behavior. There are some people who are also working on this idea that you can create a marketplace where we can actually uh, project our, our desire on how our data is going to be used and let companies compete with us, uh, compete for the right to serve us. It's a very nice idea from a sort of theoretical perspective, but I don't see it happening in practice. Because I frankly think that we don't have any anonymity now. Um, there's so much data outside, out, out right now that if somebody really wants to find out your social security number, your date of birth, your addresses, your credit history, they can do it. So I kind of think that the genie's out of the bottle. What we need is education. And we should be educating our children, because privacy is different for different generations. And we should be educa educating our peers, so that they understand what they are giving up whenever they are signing those terms of service. Yes, sir. Well, uh, thank you for this alarming uh, introduction to the uh, web world. Uh, do you think uh, there is a big challenge to the open web from the side of uh, behavioral than economical political organization of the web? I mean, the, uh, of course, this is structurally decentralized, but uh, does it mean there is no center? There is a lot of center. And some of this center behave like the big hubs or like the super centralized islands like corporate uh, cloud computing uh, services, uh, this kind of things, totally centralistic in the, uh, uh, in the way of organizing the thing, the big data, et cetera. And the second is the big uh, global uh, industry of uh, surveillance and uh, security. And the third one is the 
big push of strength against privacy and anonymity and etc. Thanks. Um, so, wh what is the governance of the internet? ICANN or the UN? Why aren't we asking? What is the governance? Would you belong to an organization and not know who is, how it's organized, what the bylaws are, who's on the board, who makes decisions, who gave money to whom? We're not asking these questions. And we are letting the government decide and negotiate for us, for us in secret. And the corporations are, in many cases, more powerful than the governments. Apple has more money in its account than the US government does. And uh, in the, if you haven't seen it, uh, an actor, Richard Dreyfuss, actually did an entire performance uh, reading the Apple Terms of Service. It took him an hour and a half. Uh, I'm, I have to say, there are many other people who, are, who will be speaking here who know this subject much better than me. I'm not really a, uh, a, uh, an expert on internet law, internet protocols, uh, international trade agreements around technology. I'm just a member of the internet public wondering who is collecting my data every time I hit agree on one of these buttons. And then watching whistleblowers be put in jail by the US government, or people being arrested or killed in Russia, or Mubarak shutting off the internet in Egypt. We should all be asking these questions. I'm not an expert. Anyone else? Maybe one more? Hi, Please. Andy. Thanks so much. It was very good uh, that you raised awareness about these issues. Uh, I just wanted to um, inform the public here that uh, during my Twitter case, uh, where uh, the Twitter or the US government demanded that Twitter would hand over my information, in the first court ruling, it basically the judge said that we don't have the right to protect our own backs once we hit the agree uh, button. Uh, we have to rely on the social media to do it for us. And now the question is, is that reversible? I'm not, I don't understand US law, uh, but what I understand is that all the social services we use uh, is hosted in one way or another in the United States, and thus we're all uh, a subject of being um, probed into. Uh, and many people don't understand that the uh, governments that have access like this, um, they have even much greater access than if, for example, they would go into your physical home. So what can we, do you have any ideas what we can do to reverse this? Or if this really bad court ruling can be maybe reversed, can we, as the people of the internet, do anything to put pressure? I, well, that's why I'm trying. I mean, we can try. The problem is, is that uh, the people who are making those laws and making those rules don't want the open internet. They don't, they, it's a threat to them. So why would they write a law to make it easier for the public to tell them what to do? Or to do it in a way that's more fair or more equitable? They have no reason to. I mean, the analogy I come to think of is it's like, uh, you know, forget the internet. Imagine the, uh, the conversion of our society from the agricultural age to the industrial age. It's like we are all, uh, you know, running factories and, uh, and own steam engines, and we're going to the uh, horse owners to ask them to write the laws for us. It's really that ridiculous. They don't want the open internet. So why, are, so how could we possibly expect them to write laws that are favorable towards the open internet? Yes, there's some investment uh, bankers who will say we need an open internet in order to be able to uh, stimulate economic development but there's so few of those voices. The voices we need are the ones that are in this room and our brethren all over the world. We're not asking, we're not demanding, we're not reading. We have to change it, Brigitte. That's why if you don't, if you don't follow me, Brigitte, you should be. There are, there are some people in the, in the world who are members of the internet public that have what I would call idle status because they're fighting for these rights. And if you don't know her, you should know Brigitte because she's been fighting this for longer than I have and she may be able to help us find a way. Anyway, I'm gonna be around for the rest of the day. If you see me, please come, please follow me on Twitter um, and I'll be back next year and see how we did. Thank you very much.
Andrew.